Thank you for joining us today, Sharon. Um, Sharon Redman is an expert in the field of literacy for special needs students. And she's uh, working with some young students right now and um, is going to share some of her experiences uh, with uh, using the uh, Comprehensive Literacy Handbook and uh, her current students. Thank you for joining us today, Sharon. Thanks, Sue. Well, welcome, everyone. I know we only have a few here. So um, please, if you have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat and um, Sue will kind of monitor that. And uh, I'm happy to stop and answer as we go through. This is jam packed full of information of the things we do. And it was actually even just talking to Sue, like I could take each one of these sections and easily make them into an hour long um, presentation each one. And so we're gonna be looking at all 12 today um, and talking about them. So welcome again, my name is Sharon Redman. I'm a special education um, teacher and have been teaching in the field for um, almost 20 years. I also have my uh, assistive technology practitioners um, license as well, ATP. And, as an, and I'm an assistive technology specialist. So currently I'm working for the Port Townsend School District and I work for um, in a classroom we call the SAIL program at the elementary level. I have kids uh, kindergarten through fifth grade that um, are more impacted by their disabilities um, than most students in our schools. So I, I typically end up with uh, students on my caseload that have more low incident um, rate of disabilities. So um, when I saw Comprehensive Literacy Instruction for All in the book, and there was a book study, I jumped on that right away. And uh, my schedule was just too crazy to be able to um, attend those um, great webinars that Setsi is putting on. And so I decided that I was going to do this, um, do this on my own. So um, this is all from my reading and interpretation. I have gone through and um, went back into Setsi and have watched their webinars. I really encourage you guys to do that. But this is really my journey through uh, utilizing these comprehensive literacy um, instruction strategies and implementing them kind of real world, real time. So um, it goes from reading in the book and what we know from that science and from the research and putting that into practice. And so hopefully um, you'll learn a few things of things that I do or some takeaways, um, or maybe you've put things into practice and that you would love to share. Uh, that would be great as well because I think we're always, I know I am a lifelong learner and always learning how to improve my practice to move forward. So that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna be taking a look at, uh, at my journey and what we've done so far. Okay, so I'm gonna just move this up here. Move this over to the side, there we go. So um, this is my first year in this position. I have taught individuals that are more impacted by their disabilities um, for many years. Uh, however, the, I have moved around a lot and um, in my career and taught overseas for many years. My husband's job kind of necessitates that. So we um, are now kind of in this area and this is my first year within this position. Um, very happy, one of my favorites, favorite teaching positions I've had. And so my goals this year when I was setting these was really to look at that literacy, that AAC, and that communication is our top priority for our students. And so what did that kind of look like and kind of give you some background knowledge about what my classroom was, what we did, um, kind of what it looks like. So you know, we have been in this year of COVID, um, we've been, we have pivoted now five, four times. I'm waiting for the fifth. We started in-person instruction um, in a blended model at the beginning of the year and where we did then extra support um, for some students, two extra afternoons a week. Um, October, November hit, school got shut down. 
um, for our gen ed folks. And then my group went into, um, still came to school, but this time four days a week, half time. And what we did was more of a self-contained um, type of practice because there are no other students here on campus. So, uh, and then we pivoted again to back to the original model, but with some tweaking. And then now uh, two weeks ago, we have been um, in person, um, the whole school back five days full time um, in person. So I'm going through all of those changes and schedules. My classroom, I have 10 students and I have 10 students that have, uh, their needs are, are pretty significant in the far as adaptive and for medical um, and safety. So I have uh, 10 one-on-one -on -one paraprofessionals that are with them and we do inclusionary practices. So they are, um, in, we do this inclusion within the gen ed setting as much as possible. Um, so they, what's the interesting part about that is right now is I, um, when we were, uh, when we were in a blended model and part-time, we had the, the enough, we had enough staff. And so now it is just making sure that, that we have that bolstered up again. So that just takes a little bit of time. It doesn't seem to pivot as easy as, um, as bringing, just being able to bring kids back. So, but we're making it work. So curriculum, that was a really big deal for me was making sure that my students had this, had curriculum. There had been some pieces and parts um, that I had noticed that had been here throughout the year or throughout the years. Um, speaking with the staff, you know, they had used the unique curriculum last year um, in a printed form and not used in its entirety as an online version. Um, and there was some success and we struggled with that um, in the beginning of the year and tried it. And so we really wanted to make some good decisions about curriculum. Um, and that's where this comprehensive literacy instruction really came in. Um, and then we also had some Edmark, which we primarily use for, um, for that sight word reading piece. Um, and the fact that it, it has some mirrorless learning and there's some pieces in there that um, really are kind of that ABA type of look that work for some of my students. So um, that is part, but is not the whole, and I would never feel comfortable with that being your whole literacy um, curriculum to use within a classroom. Um, so the CIL, the comprehensive, um, well, CLI, comprehensive literacy instruction, I have to fix that. Um, and then uh, writing and using the alternative pencil, um, making sure that kids, all kids have access to that. Also using our AAC we wanted to look at different math curriculums. Um, one of the curriculums that we have here um, that was here was equals. So we're just kind of piloting that and taking a look and seeing if that's something that we want to continue with. Um, using AAC systems, I have four different types of systems that uh, are used in the classroom. So we have Lampworts for Life, um, Pod 20, Pod um, just one page that is for partner assisted scanning. Uh, we had Snap Plus Core and we're also doing, um, oh gosh, I can't remember the other one. There's too many of them. It'll come to me. Anyway, I always forget the name of that one. Um, so we have all these systems and we needed a lot of training and how to implement that and bring that into a student's whole day where communication just didn't happen when they were with me with their device, but that it happened throughout their day and they were immersed in aided language stimulation all day long, whether they were doing math or reading or writing or on the playground or with their peers in science and social studies. So um, we really wanted to make sure that we worked on looking at that and implementing core word strategies along with some balance to that of having um, fringe. And so that has, we've, we've done a lot um, and a lot of really good work with that. Um, AT just then plain assistive technology with its access to utilizing some of our computer, um, 
our computer access tools that we have. So we use Read and Write for Google and we're a Google uh, school. And so then teaching our staff and gen ed teachers and paraeducators how we can use these tools for our students that have more significant needs, that it's still appropriate. And so we've been working really hard on all those pieces. So we're going to just dive in um, into this comprehensive um, literacy instruction. And boy, yesterday when I wrote this, um, I really kept putting in CIL instead of CLI. I'll fix that, um, but that'll update right away. So, you know, I, I started out um, really thinking, like looking at this book um, and reading that I was going to implement, my commitment was to do three parts, um, three pieces. And so I knew and I believed that that was possible and I knew it was going to be hard, but I also knew that we could do those hard things. And so I just, so when looking through this book, I kind of went through that, that alphabet knowledge and phonological awareness was going to be key. That most, I had a couple of kids that had that, um, but most of my students had not. And so um, we really needed to kind of go back. Um, most of my kids, except for one, um, my students were emergent in all of their areas in reading, writing. Um, and so we really needed to kind of start kind of back there. And I felt that that was us getting that language um, and how to go about that was going to be that, that big piece. Um, I also kind of it was a really kind of a shift, um, not for myself, but for others to really think of my students as readers and my students as writers and for my students to sh make that shift and to know themselves as readers and themselves and see themselves as writers. And so having that language in this in the classroom where we talk about you are, we're gonna be authors today, you are a writer. And writers use different tools, lots of things to use to write. And you are a reader and we are all readers and good readers do this. So having that language and naming that was just a really important piece um, to this puzzle. And I think what that did is it really, it gave uh, credence to that idea of presuming competence, right? Of presuming that potential and that all students have a right. When you read through this book, one of the first things that, um, that they say, that David Copenhaver and Karen Erickson say, really they talk about how it is their right. It is a fundamental right to learn to read and write. And that everyone, all students can learn to read and write. And so that's really, really important. Um, this is going to be a live link right here to Setsy to their YouTube channel that has all of, and I'm going to, I'm going to try it. Um, so just let me know if, if it goes and doesn't open up for you. If you can, I'm hoping you can all see this. So this if you work in a team, <clears throat> you should be using London. Everyone straight to their book studies where they have all of the book studies that you can go through, through for, with Setsy. Um, really, really important. I took, you know, tons of notes. I started with the chapters that I really wanted to focus on um, and then went from there. I haven't gotten through them all, but I've kind of skipped around. So I'm almost done. Um, so really important and a great resource where they, they, they discuss this idea in this book study of during this book study of all the points within that chapter. And so I was able to benefit from those points and then take them and try them out and put them into practice. Okay, let's see here. Okay, the other piece was is with, with uh, putting this together and comprehensive literacy instruction is that I didn't want to feel overwhelmed, especially in the age of COVID. I really wanted to make sure that I took my time and I got I got these pieces down and I, that they made sense and that my uh, my staff, our paraeducators, were also able to implement that with fidelity. And so we worked really hard um, at doing that. One of the things, oops, one of the things that I started with with these three lessons um, 
was the phonological awareness um, and some takeaways that I found were really, really important and different. And if you've taught phonological awareness and I really like their approach, they do this cycling approach with the letters and with the alphabet to get you through a year. We ended up not being able to follow that fully because we were in part-time and I only saw my kids two days a week. So um, for that instructional piece. And so it was really difficult to be able to keep the cycle going as quickly as we wanted to. So we just didn't make it through all of those cycles in a year like you should be able to during a non-COVID um, type year. So, so some of these takeaways that we looked at um, that were a little different <clears throat> is that, you know, the letter is represented by the sound, just that verbiage um, was a change of practice for many of our, for many of the paraeducators that I work with. Um, and it's important, and I can see the importance of using that verbiage as you go through. And then also for our individuals that don't say it um, and don't have that verbal speech and working with them to say, uh, I'm going to say it and we're going to, I'm going to say it out loud and you're going to read it in your head, or we're both going to read it in our head together. And then I use a lot of metacognitive talk with that as well. So, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll see that as we go through. Um, Cause I've, I've put these, I've broken these out even further as we go through our time together. So emergent reading, um, the pieces that I thought were really important there was that car, um, the car in the crowd, <clears throat> excuse me, and AAC shared reading and what that looked like. How am I bringing, you know, this AAC into every piece that we're doing when it comes into alphabetic, um, alphabet knowledge and phonological awareness into our emergent reading and shared reading in our interactive reading act opportunities. And then also, and we'll go over car and crowd if you don't know what that is, we'll go over that in a little bit. Um, emergent writing, really excited about this piece because I just did not feel confident about my instruction in writing with my students. And I knew I was missing something really, really important. And this just put it all together. And I had pieces of all of it, but this really just kind of put it all together. So it all made some really good sense and was cohesive. And I am seeing huge gains by using this piece. It's, it's by far one of my favorite times um, in teaching this year has been doing that emergent writing um, in using predictable chart writing. Um, we talk a lot about the alternative, we use alternative pencil, we use um, our keyboards, we talk about what makes a writer and we'll go through that again. So let's see here. Um, okay, I did learn really quickly that um, trying to keep all of this straight, even with just these three pieces, um, was something that I needed help with. And so one of the things that I did was, um, and I'm just gonna go back. And I thought I had this uh, highlighted or ready to go, but with a lesson plan. So I have lesson plans that I've created to help me with, um, to create that. And I'll share that here just in, uh, probably at the end. This was supposed to be a hot link, but maybe it's in a different lesson or different um, slide. So what happened is that I found that I had this urgency not to just do three things, that I had this urgency to do them all. And so we, we really started out that first part of the year, the first few months, really working on those three areas, um, the alphabetic awareness, some shared reading in AAC, and then also um, emergent writing and um, predictable chart writing. And then quickly moved um, into this word work. How can we bring word work in? I feel so often kids get stuck in those, you know, flashcards and knowing their letters and knowing their sounds, but they never really get to move on in what they do with that. So that was really important. It looks like I have a hand raise. I'm just gonna go in and see. Or, or um, Sue, is there a question in the chat? 
I can't see that right no, now. No, I don't see any new questions. Oh, okay. Maybe that was a mistake. Oh, wait, there's a Q and A. Oh, can you give us an example? Oh, it says, uh, can you please give examples? Yeah, can you give example? I and going um, to get... when you open, go ahead. When you open um, like your Q and A, you are making a gray box on top of your slideshow. That's kind of what I so figured. That's why careful. I was hopefully <laughs> having you open that because I knew if I did it, then everybody would just see big gray box, like the void. <laughs> Okay, so yes, I'm gonna give you tons of examples of what this looks like. So, um, and you know, I really thought when I first decided to do this, um, um, to do this webinar that I was really only gonna do those three, but really found out that I, we are gonna do all of them. So and that's what we do. And I have some examples on the board behind me, but I also have tons of pictures to show you. I had a video, but it was not loading. I could not get it to get off my phone, so, um, so my apologies for that. So we're gonna be looking at this AAC and word work. Um, the one area that we're just starting to kind of dive into is the self-directed reading and silent reading. And we've done a little bit of work on that, but not as much as um, I'd hoped. And I'm, I'm, you know, school year isn't done yet. So I have, I have great, um, I know that we're gonna do great things with that. So AAC and comprehension, this is for a little help with Readtopia. Um, you'll see where that journey has taken me. Um, AAC and emergent writing, talked about predictable chart, shared reading, and again, AAC and phonics. So here we have this alphabet um, phonological awareness and it's really easy, seven steps. The letter is represented by the sound, I say, I, I say while you say it in your head, you know, we use these strategies. Those are really the takeaways. And I quickly realized that, and I made in here, if you have access, that you can make a copy of these pieces that I've taken out. So what I've used is I've gone in, I searched everywhere and couldn't find information for myself to just have a cheat sheet. It was all in the book, but I didn't have it so that I could just have it with me and have it with my paraeducators. And so that was really important. So I found a couple different resources. Um, there was one through Chapel Hill that um, with Karen Erickson and um, Center for Literacy and Disabilities. And then there was another one down on the bottom. I think I have it um, linked in here that um, also gave some um, helpful information in how to implement these. So I just, what I did is I put these in, I gave quick little um, visual supports for us as adults because it's visual supports. If you've ever been to one of my um, webinars on that, you know, are super important, just not for students, but for everyone. And so having this, um, those little visual supports are great and it kind of cues us in. So these have been really, really helpful for us to be able to implement them. And when I say with fidelity, that's what I mean is being able to, and there were times where we were like highlighting, I'd give them a new paper every day. We would go through this and we would really just take it slow so that we went through. What we do now, and you'll hear this, we'll talk about this in word work is that we've kind of morphed these two together and to do this, um, this work within our word work activities. So these were really, this was a really important piece. Here is that six instructional cycles that I talked about um, were the different cycles of how you present the letters. It was hard for us to get through all of these cycles and we kind of had to adjust that a little bit. And these are just suggestions, so as well. So let's go back. Um, okay, so here are some examples. Um, you know, working with letters, you need to have letters to work with letters. We have um, our alternative pencil and someone just swiped it off my table. And I will at the end go and grab that so you can see the alternative pencil that we've created for our room. Um, we, use our, we use our talkers. Um, when we are looking and working with letters, we talk very specifically what that looks like. And when we're communicating in writing, that that is a different way to use our tools, our communication tools and use our keyboard 
we spend a lot of time in our keyboard on all of our devices. And that is just a really key piece um, in the distinction between, uh, and you'll, we'll get to that, when, especially when we talk about symbolic text and it'll make a lot more or symbol it text and putting in um, putting symbols with our text, which we know is not um, best practice anymore. So, and the reasons why that is. So we really work very hard um, utilizing this when we are going through um, and we find the letter A, we're bringing these letters down from our lessons and we are going to put them together. We go through those first few steps. We'll say this is a lowercase a. It's represented by the a sound, right? Now we're going to find these letters and now we're going to build words with these words, with these letters. We also talk a lot during this time. My kids were really struggling. What is in the beginning? What's the beginning sound? What's the middle sound? What's the ending sound? And this has given us a nice structure to be able to really focus in on those points and to help them understand that there are parts of when we segment and blend those words together and being very specific. So this has been really great to be able to use their their devices. Um, if they don't, all of my students have devices. I have one student who doesn't necessarily uh, use it um, very well yet. We're still working on um, integrating that um, into her communication systems and modalities. And so with her, we use an alternative pencil and even that sometimes is difficult. Um, and we also have blank boards, um, just core boards that we have of different devices laying around all over the room and um, alphabet boards and as well as the QWERTY keyboard. So um, moving into emergent reading. Um, so one of the things that this is where I wanted to talk about this symbolic text and which was a practice for a very long time and I, I did it all the time, um, which was taking books and bringing in the icons that they use um, for communication and pairing them with the text. And one of the things that we know right now in the research and Karen Erickson and David Copenhaver address this in the book is that they talk about that there's actual research that says that that putting a symbol with a text in the context of reading not in the context of communication, but in the context of reading. And I get that those three, reading, writing, and communicating, oral communication, that they are very intertwined. And so it gets really, really sticky. But it slows the process of students that have disabilities to learn how to read. That those pictures, when it's within a sentence and you are working on fluency and you are working on reading, that it, it slows that down. And so it is no longer supported in the research. And so now that we know better, then now we need to do better, right? So having a picture, um, a symbol that kind of represents maybe the concept um, of the whole piece that can be supported as a visual support. But the idea of symboliting symbolic text and putting symbols on every single word, we know in the research that that's just not something that we do anymore. And it's a detrimental to our students learning how to read. Um, so I'm gonna get off of that and we'll talk about a little bit more with that um, symbolic text because it really was hard for me to kind of make that shift. And I'm like, wait a minute, what about this? What about this? And I really had a hard time, um, but I, I get it now. I really understand that with you in this context with symbolic communication, separating that from communication, using it to get us for communication um, is different than getting us using it for reading and different from using symbolic or symbolic communication for writing. So um, I think that that's just important. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about how that, and it's still murky and it's still squishy. Um, it's just, we want, I wanna make sure that we highlight on that. 
Um, was there a chat that came in? I saw another message. So if that was, if something's important, let me know and then we can address that. So I talked about emergent reading. We utilize this strategy when we are doing um, shared reading, when we are doing our, um, our interactive reading that we use this. And CAR stands for that comment, that ask and then respond. And it's just a way to help us go through. And I'll pull, bring that up again. When you click on this, it's going to ask you to make a copy and that will take you into, again, I had felt like I needed to make these documents to help us through because I had my book, but my paras and everybody else in my classroom didn't have any of those materials. So I went through and made all of these for ourselves. And we have a literacy, a comprehensive literacy book. Everybody has, every pair in my classroom has so that they have access to these things. Excuse me. So CAR. So when we follow this CAR approach, um, we're going to lead with a comment. We're going to make a comment about something we see in, in our book and on that page. And we're going to then just stop and give some time some processing time and wait. And then we're gonna maybe ask a question, right? And then give some time and wait that five seconds and give some processing time. And then hopefully we can then respond to what a student has either made a comment or responded on. And this has taken some practice. This has been something that I've had to, um, really work with them and show how to do. Because otherwise I felt like at, a, at the beginning, I was just standing there waiting for someone to comment and to, to what that looked like. So they really, they didn't know what to do. We had, I had to teach my students that, that when I lead with a comment, that that is, we're gonna look, and this is really interesting. And I see something and I give some of those, um, sentence starters that they could then also, you know, I wonder what that is or ask a question and say, I'm going to ask a who question. Here it comes. I'm going to ask a who question or I'm going to ask a what question um, and then go through. And then I also will look at and point to the pictures that are in the story. I'm going to ask a who question. That's about a person. Let's look at the picture. Who do you see in this? Um, picture. So really kind of helping them along so that they can now, and now they are, when I make a comment, they're jumping up and they are making comments. They're going straight to their talkers and, and having that communication, that oral communication with their, with their, um, with their symbols on their, on their talkers that they're using. So I see some questions coming in, but I know if I do that, I'll kind of Stop. So I'll wait for Sue. Just let me know if you think I need to stop in and, and check in and answer some questions that are in there. No, it's it's me asking a couple of our new people what their email address is so we okay. can make Great. sure they have a, an account and get credit for their hours. Great. Perfect. Okay, good. Okay. And so then now that we, we really worked on just doing car, we felt that putting, you know, using crowd, um, and we're still working on using the crowd response. So putting the car, the common ask respond within that in the crowd, which is this idea of this completion. So leaving a blank at the end of the sentence and having students fill it in, you know, typically used in the repetitive phrase or those closed um, activities that recall, you know, asking questions about what just happened, open-ended, you know, tell me what's happening in the picture. So we've been putting that in. Um, the hard part is that I just get into it and all these things naturally flow. And I'm just trying to learn how to maybe put it into a better sequence. Um, so, but we're getting them in. So maybe that's all that, that's all that matters. Maybe someone else, maybe Karen Erickson would probably say something different. Nope, we got to go in line. But I think that as long as we're getting these pieces in when they make sense in the contextual nature of our text, that that makes, that that is, that's what's important. And that, that distance. So um, 
So that questions that build a bridge between the book and that personal experience, you know, so making those, that connection between self, you know, and the text self in the world, but using really pulling from our gen ed, um, our gen ed literacy instruction of what that looks like. So of that making those connections between self and the text or self in the world. And there's one other, and of course I can't remember. So really, really, this is really kind of, you know, we have these up, we have them out. It helps bring me back, making sure that I've hit all these pieces within our shared reading experience. Um, we slow down. We utilize um, a lot of uh, a lot of words within our our communication devices. We also will, you know, accept gestures. We accept coming to the board and maybe pointing to different things as as my students are commenting. Um, really, it's it, the whole is engaging them in meaningful text and meaningful dialogue about the text and making those connections to self. So we used um, a, you know, a lot of interactive reading strategies as well. Same, I use the car in the crowd within that area. Um, we utilize a lot of Tar Heel Reader as well for that emergent reading. So going and finding um, more text um, out there that has that, um, maybe the, the different uh, we're using uh, right now, we have um, Readtopia and I'm using Dr. Doolittle. And so we will go and we will find more books that will expand on that. So, um, so here is some things, I really wish I could move this out of the way even more, but it's not letting me. So when I didn't have, I do have Readtopia now, we switched from the uni curriculum to Readtopia. I felt that that better matched my set of values and what I was trying to do um, within my classroom. And so when with this emergent reader though, at the beginning, I didn't have that. And so I, we did have Boardmaker and even though Boardmaker was kind of a little bit of a disaster in um, the beginning of the year, I was still able to access their, um, their curriculum materials. And so we use Poppleton in winter and I set that into a six week um, book experience that we did. We implemented this, you know, the alphabetic um, phonological awareness, the emergent reading, emergent writing into these pieces. We also did, we had, which was during this time, was when we had the whole school to ourselves, which meant I had the whole art teacher and we had as much time as we wanted, which was amazing. And so it was right before Christmas. We did, um, if you've ever read Poppleton, he molds with clay and he makes a bust. And so we molded with clay and we made little gnomes. Um, and then he does other things where he is painting and um, a craft project. And so we did that and made masks because we were having a play at the end to celebrate this story um, and, all the, and use all of this rich language that we had read in our story of Poppleton in winter. And so that was a really positive thing. So one of the things I wanted to make sure is that they talked about, like, I didn't have the Retopia curriculum that was um, Karen Erickson, David Copenhaver were integral in creating with Don, Don, Don Johnson. And so you will, if you do have Retopia, you will see that all of the pieces that are in the comprehensive literacy instruction book it is in their materials. I didn't have that, so I had to make my own and create this. And going and using what I had really worked well and using Boardmaker worked really well. So um, if you don't, you don't have to have a pre-made curriculum like Readtopia, even though I highly recommend it, but um, but you can do this with other, with other areas. And then doing this and making it fully, um, immersive, you know, going in and really expanding that. The first chapter, and I don't have a picture of this and I'm so bummed, um, we painted with ice because it's all about icicles that are falling down and they make things out of this icicles. And so we painted with ice in the second chapter, 
we we molded with clay and then the third chapter we did this play with you know all the materials that we had made with and so um really immersive experience we wrote about all of these things in our emergent writing as well so um super super great we had such a great time okay Here's um, more pictures because we did have such a great time of Poppleton in the winter. And so we had a sleigh ride. We were again, the only ones in school. So we had this sleigh ride and we took um, everyone around the school and we had been practicing the different um, songs, um, which one we did was Jingle Bells because they go on this sleigh ride and there are Jingle Bells on the sleigh ride in Poppleton. So we took them and did that and went around the school and the kids, this was our sleigh, and then we had our little reindeer and the little, um, little I don't know, what do they call them, those OT bike things that they, that they go back and forth. So really had this wonderful experience where we were able to get out of the classroom and show all the things that we learned. Um, we programmed their devices so that they could make comments about the songs. We programmed them. They had that so that they could, um, some single message ones for the singing for students that were only able to participate that way. So it's really great. Emergent writing, my ultimate favorite. Like I, I'm obsessed with predict predictable chart writing. I, I truly am. So we, um, I have some, where is it? It's right here our predictable chart writing, and I'll kind of zoom in. I don't know if you can see this, but it's just one of my favorite things. So we, you know, start with ideas and we write them out in our chart. And this time we talked about people and things that I can help. And we use this throughout the weeks. And we go through and we like, we come up with like, let's find all of the lowercase c's today. Cause that was in our lesson in our word work lesson or in our phonological awareness lesson. And we're gonna find all the c's today. This is a lowercase c and you can really then bring those lessons then into some real applicable real world activities for them. And that just is really, it's a beautiful connection and makes that. Then we write these together. We refer back to this um, at least twice a week when we're doing um, word work, if we're doing thinking about ideas, and if we're thinking about and then working on our writing. And so having all of our sentence and rereading our writing. So one of the really great things, um, I'll, I have it at the end, I've been listening to this Loma podcast and I was listening to one um, the other day and I'm not remembering who was on, um, but anyway, they were talking about what makes a writer. And this was just so brilliant that it takes like five things to make a writer. And so I just wanted to share this um, with you. So these five things to be a writer that you need ideas, you need letters, you need words, you need spaces and you need punctuation. And that's it. That's what makes a writer. And so we really, really have been working on this um, with my students. And it was interesting because today uh, I was working with one of my fifth graders that has not had a lot of robust literacy instruction. And we were working through, and I had made some assumptions that he knew where spaces were in his writing, that he knew what the letters, the difference between letters and words were. He knew what punctuation was, that he'd been exposed to this. And that just wasn't the case. And so now I know that I need to go back and we need to really explore what it looks like for him to be an author and that he needs tools to do that. We talk about how writing for some of our friends, they use they use a pencil. For some of our friends, they use an alternative pencil. For some of our friends, they use a keyboard on their talker. And this is where we've really been kind of separating out. And we talk about how we're gonna write now in our word work, it's time to write this word. And so like today, what we did is, it's on this side, we were writing, um, in is, let me move it over 
here. So we were doing this. We were looking at words that started with the letter I. In is island idea. It's that's those are the words that we found within our writing. And then we went in and we wanted in our word work, we were going to write these. Now, easily in the beginning of the year, what I was doing is I was having kids go into their core words and finding it in their core words and using that as the writing. And the more that I thought about this idea of not pairing symbols to text when we're in reading and in writing, the more I really wanted to pull away from that. And so we talked about two different ways that we could find this in our, in, on our talker. That if you wanted to talk to me about that you saw the word in, in the story, or Dr. Doolittle was in the boat, then, then we're going to use our symbols to do that. But if you're going to communicate with me in writing, then we're going to use our, um, our keyboard. And we're going to separate that out. And so now we're going to spell in, right? We can use our predictive text. We can use that. But we need to be a writer. Nowhere on here does it say you need symbols to be a writer. It says you need letters, words, spaces, and punctuation, and an idea right? We can use symbols to be a visual support or to be an idea to start our work from, but it is not something that we use when we're writing. And so I really wanted to separate this out for our kids so that we can really, we can have them become faster communicators in writing and developing those ideas and using a keyboard. Word work. So um, love, love word work. Um, really what, what helped me really kind of hone this word work piece in was getting my Retopia, getting the Retopia stuff. Um, you know, we go through this word work activity. I've done all these pieces. And if you've taught, you've done parts and bits and pieces of this. And again, what was nice is that this just gave me a very clear set of making sure I got through all of it. So working, we put letters and names and sounds. That's part of our phonological awareness where we name them, right? And then part of the phonological awareness is putting them into a word and reading those words, reading them in our head, reading them out loud. And so now this word work takes that into now even a bigger place where we sort them in columns. And so like today, we were sorting things like what words start with the letter I. We were sorting that. And then we sorted what words have I in the middle of our word. And we sorted those words and we had them on the board. Really, really great. Everybody came up. They had their letter tiles that we use from our foundations materials and put them on the board and were able to um, that. So I was able to grab a few pictures from this morning, actually. So here's our word work. Um, and I have my friend Lisa here coming up and she is, let me, this is in the way, you can't see her cutie patootie face. So she, what we were doing is putting, sorting our words that we did. Everybody had one word and we're not talking about tons of words. And I have three kids in my class. So we used three words. And we put them into different columns. So we had just done what was in the middle. And then we also worked on words that had an S at the beginning and we moved them and kids could start seeing the fluidity that, that letters and that come together and how you um, combine them and you can blend and segment and make new words. That was just really important. And then being able to use the words, say them. And then what we did is finding all of these I words over here were words that were in our Readtopia um, activity this after or this morning. So we were reading through chapter nine and there were pirates and we were on an island and someone had an idea. So we really pulling out and drawing attention to these parts of um, of writing and parts of reading and making sure that we had all of that. So really, really, um, it just was, it was such a great lesson and it was so fun. And she was very excited to come up and show her work that she had done and being able to say that. Um, 
it was pretty, it was really powerful. Um, so I'm running out of time. So I'm just going to go through this really quick comprehension. Um, we use that as far as just asking and using AEC at the beginning. Now that I have Retopia, we're using a lot of more of those closed reading activities to answer those WH questions. And the other thing that we're also learning, what we found out is that our kids miss out in, in even though they're included in the gen ed, not understanding what underlining the answer is or putting a circle around the answer or putting an X on the one that you want. So, or you don't want, whichever it is. So really following these directions and being very specific with those tasks, because it's something that I think we just think that they're, they've picked up and that they know, but our kids were not. So those are, that's what we're focusing on right now is just when we're answering and doing these closed reading activities of going through and underlining, circling, thing next. So they have experience with that, where we slow down, where we slow down. Um, Self-directed reading, we're doing a little bit, like I said, we're still under construction on this. Um, you know, we do a little bit of silent reading. This is what that looks like. Here, I'm going to silently read, you silently read. Um, what type of books are you going to pick out? We do a little bit with that with Tar Heel Reader. Um, they, you know, haven't been able to go to the library this year. They haven't been able to pick things out, you know, like that. So, um, so that's just been a little bit slower in coming. But I'm super excited to learn more about it. So, under construction, we're just gonna go there. So this was so much more to learn. Um, this is the Loma podcast that I was talking about. I have not listened to this one um, with Caroline Musselwhite, but I'm really, really excited to, to hear this. Um, some really, really great, great um, people have been on and talking about comprehensive literacy instruction this season um, of these last episodes. They've been really focusing on this literacy piece and the comprehensive literacy instruction. So I encourage you, the link is here. It'll take you to the podcast, to their website um, that you can then download and to your you know, favorite podcast player um, and to be able to see. And they have tons and tons of, um, of episodes and resources. So they're in their fifth season. So um, a mom uh, that has a child with special needs, she's the one who started this podcast. And so I encourage you to take, go and take a look at that. So um, we have a few minutes for questions. If anybody has any questions, like I said, it was gonna go really fast. I can't get in too deep because it's all of it that we've been doing, but I've learned a lot and I have really been excited about this. I do wanna go back. I wanted to share one more thing. Sorry, I hope I'm, I'm probably making you very dizzy. There we go the emergent writer. Um, okay, I'm gonna stop, stop touching. Um, one of my students, um, when we were doing this predictable chart writing, uh, the picture, what we had, what we were reading about is I can help and that Dr. Doolittle could help and that there were some pictures that we had just in the pictures that we had read in that chapter about being frustrated and mad. And um, this little girl who is just starting to really understand and to use her communication device went and very fast hit mad, frustrated, defend, defend, protect. And we, and then looked at her sister, you know, and I was, and it was so powerful because I would have never have known that I would have never guessed that she had those words um, and she would have put them together within any type of writing as we were communicating about it, as we were generating these ideas and using their, um, their communication devices to do that. So super powerful stuff that the, can come out of this, um, giving them the opportunity and the space and the structure in which to, in which to explore these areas to become writers and authors and readers. Okay, any questions? 
I haven't done this webinar before, so I was I was hoping I'd be able to keep it within the hour. I knew it was going to be tough because there's so much more that I want to talk about. But and hopefully I also gave examples. So I want to just check in with that person to make sure that I, I gave the examples. And like I said, I could do a whole hour just on emergent writer. I could probably even do more than that. Uh, just on emergent writing and then on, on all of these pieces, really. And how we really incorporate their AAC in communicating uh, and talking about what we're doing. And then going back and forth to their... Um, keyboard or to the alternative pencil. Oh, I was going to show the alternative pencil. All right. I am going to grab that. It's right here. Guys, right, sorry about that. I had it sitting out. So this is the alternative pencil that we've created. It sits on a desk like this. Um, and we put it into uh, the QWERTY keyboard. Um, because I want to facilitate that as much as possible. Our students will easily be seeing a QWERTY keyboard wherever they go. They lift, they get a Chromebook, a laptop, even on their iPads. This is one that is very, that's the most prominent. And so this is the one that we want to expose them. I want to expose them to the most. Um, and then we have tabs on here. And then we go through, we were also working on digraphs. So I added those, but it, this one got mixed up and put in, and then we're also work on punctuation. And then when we talk about <clears throat> turning the page, do they wanna say more? Are they finished? And then also um, a space, yeah. And then on the back, then we also then can talk to, talk to our students and say, what, well, what color are they wanting to use? What kind of, what kind of, um, pencil or marker or crayon do they want to use today so that we can have some of that communication right there um, in case their talker is not available, which it should be, but just in case. So I want to thank everyone for coming and um, spending this time with me. I appreciate it. I hope that um, you're able to uh, take away a few things, maybe learn some things, um, or maybe it just um, told you, yep, you're doing your, what you're doing, other people are doing too, so. All right, thanks everyone. Um, Harsha had a question. When okay. using the AAC device as an alternative pencil, then you do not have a hard copy of the writing, correct? Let me read that. I'm seeing it now. When using an AAC device as an alternative pencil, do you, then you do not have a hard copy of the writing, correct? Um, that's n no, what I do when, if we're using their AAC device, um, we, will, we will either sometimes scribe that out just like you would as the alternative pencil. We put a lot of writing up here and we do a lot of our writing together. And so then that is up for everyone to see, for us all to see our idea generation, our writing here. There are times that I will also, you can copy um, and send the text that is in the message bar on all devices. So then I will just email that or send that in an email to us um, or dump it into a Word doc on their, um, you know, somewhere, it, you know, um, usually email is easiest or I dump it into a Word document and then print it from there or email it and then print it. So unfortunately, my kids don't, we haven't been, it's just been a weird year. They've all got new devices, trying to get everything working so that it um, can hook to the printer has been a challenge. So um, they just send it to me and then I print it out. So, but yeah, no, we make, we either scribe it like you would as you would with an alternative pencil or um, we copy, paste it into a Google doc and then send it.
And I hope that Thanks. answers your question. Okay. All right. I'm just going to look really quick. Um, okay. I think I got all the questions. So, and hopefully, um, Harsha, I get, was able to get you um, For, uh, the email samples. Um, Harsha, that would be helpful to us. Okay. Well, thanks again, everyone. I appreciate it. Oh, there it is, finally. Good. Thanks, Jennifer. Well, thank you, Sharon, for um, being our presenter today. We really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, anytime. Love this. Cool. Yeah. All right, Bye. sounds good. I will get that stuff to you. Okay. Okay. All right. Yep. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye.